I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us here on Closing Arguments. Like I've been saying, it's a big week here at Court TV. Uh, a lot of movement in cases that we've been following and tracking for years. And one of them is the disappearance of Suzanne Morphew. Uh, this is a woman married, two children, a husband, living in this beautiful home in Colorado, goes missing on Mother's Day. Well, this week, uh, her remains have been recovered, and we have a lot that we want to get to in this story. But first, let's walk you through the timeline to give you a little more perspective uh, on what happened and transpired uh, during the course of, of this case. So May 9th, 2020. Suzanne Morphew's last known communication is a selfie sent to her lover in Michigan. He replied, but she did not respond to his reply messages. May 10th, the next day, Barry, Suzanne's husband, says Suzanne was still sleeping when he left for business. And now this is May 10th, this is Mother's Day, in Broomfield, uh, Colorado. He's seen on surveillance at a Broomfield Holiday Inn with two white trash bags that morning. It's a little odd, but he is away. Barry seen on surveillance video placing the items into trash cans all around Broomfield, Colorado. That's kind of weird. That, I'm sorry, that's just weird. You take trash and you're throwing... I mean, there might be a reason for it, I guess, but... Still a little, little suspicious. Later that day, Suzanne is reported missing. Suzanne's bicycle is found near their home down a steep ravine off uh, Chafee County Road 225 from Highway 50. And that was a big part of the initial investigation. Maybe she went for a bike ride, maybe there was an accident, mountain lions, abduction, something. Like, like what is it, how did the bike get there? Um, May 11th, the next day, the search efforts begin Hundreds of people work to find Suzanne. A reward for information on her disappearance uh, begins to grow. May 13th, Suzanne's bike helmet is found less than a mile from where her bicycle was located. That's um, also an interesting fact, right? What does that mean? What picture does that paint? Uh, May 17th, so this is one week later, Barry Morphew posts a video online pleading for Suzanne's safe return. In the video, he seems to take the approach that he believes she has been abducted and says, return her, no questions asked. Okay, May 20th. This is where things get even more interesting. Uh, investigators locate a spy pen during the search of, of the Morphew's residence in one of the files, Suzanne apparently places the pen inside Barry's car, where it records him listening to multiple episodes of Forensic Files. Now, obviously, watching Forensic Files is not suspicious, right? Because, I mean, we've, we, we've had Forensic Files on Court TV. It's where the whole thing started, right? Um, but still kind of interesting when you think about how things transpire here. Uh, May 5th, 2021, okay, this is a year later. Barry is arrested, charged with first degree murder and other crimes. April 19th, 2022, flash forward almost another year. Everyone's getting ready for the trial, including Court TV. Days before the trial is set to begin, prosecutors drop charges against Barry Morphew without prejudice, meaning they can refile them. And in this picture, you see Barry, that's him with his two daughters who absolutely believe that their father is 1,000% innocent in all of this. September 22nd, Suzanne Morphew's remains are found in Moffitt, Colorado during an apparent unrelated search an unrelated search. That's a little peculiar, a little different. You're investigating another case and you find this case, which has been investigated for years. Uh, September 27th, the remains of Suzanne Morphew were positively identified. 
So that gives you some idea of how everything has transpired since um, Suzanne Morphew was last heard from and was reported missing. So you got to go back. You got to go back to 2020. Um, let's bring in a special guest uh, joining me from Denver, Colorado tonight, reporter for the Denver Gazette. Carol McKinley is with us. Um, Carol, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight, doing great reporting on this. Let me start with where Suzanne's remains were found. And I know there were reports, and I believe you were the one that was reporting all this, that there was um, a potential lead and, and there was thought that there was a spot where her body was that was difficult to access, maybe, and, and police were, it was gonna take some time to get there. Is this the area, is this the, is this the same area, we believe, where they thought she may have been and where they ended up finding her? Great question, Vinny. No, in fact, the investigation never even considered this area. This is a place that surprised everyone who was involved in the original investigation. They were looking up in the mountains behind the Morpheus home where there are a bunch of old mines. You know, Colorado was an old gold mining area. There were silver mines and, and those go way deep down. And so I know that some of the investigation was centering around these mines and nothing was ever found in them. Uh, some of the reasoning was when they dropped this case, we know where she is, but she's underneath a, a bunch of snow and we're going to have to wait till the thaw. Well, the thaw came. They didn't find anything. Fast forward to this year, another thaw, and it didn't matter anyway because that's not where she was. She was in this place about 45 minutes from where the Morphews lived, their mountain home, which was remote. This is also remote, but it's a field. And it's kind of a pasture where there's sagebrush and dry grass. And I'm, I'm told it was near a road, but it was just enough off the road to where you couldn't really see if someone was digging, you, you couldn't really see what was going on or understand. That's interesting, but so, but remote, right? Yeah. Nonetheless, you're not in the middle of a town somewhere. This is an area where maybe you could pull off the side of the road and maybe no one comes by. Yeah, and this is directly south, about 45 minutes from the Morphew home. Now, what I'm told is the way to get back to Broomfield, if Barry Morphew were to drive 45 minutes south, bury the body, add another 45 minutes on, let's say you add three hours to that trip to Broomfield, he couldn't do it. I mean, he, he was not in Sawatch on May 10th. His GPS didn't go there and his cell phone didn't go there. So it kind of makes everybody take another look and say, well, Barry was arrested for this. He was charged for it. Did he go to jail for no reason? Is he the wrong guy? Are there two people? Did someone help him? Was there an individual who was uh, maybe a, a serial killer who got involved in this? And, and uh, it wasn't Barry at all. So I think finding these remains, these bones, which were found and scattered across this field, only brings up more questions. Oh, a, a ton of questions. Now, what struck me was they were investigating another case. Is this other case, do we know what it is? Is it a murder case? And did they find anything related to that case in this area? They didn't. The other case is a woman named Edna Quintana who went missing last May 3rd, so of 2023. She was walking around in this town called Sawatch, last seen walking, and just disappeared. Her body hasn't been found, but that's who Colorado Bureau of Investigation detectives were looking for when they came across Suzanne Morphew's bones. They were like, oh my gosh, this isn't in the Quintana. It's too old because she went missing in May. Who could this be? And so they they had you know uh, uh, meetings and they called the, the DA of that area, which is a different DA who's been prosecuting this case all along. They you know got a hold of the coroner and they, uh, they sent these rem remains up to a, a, a coroner in El Paso County, which is Colorado Springs, and he's the one who identified Suzanne Morphew. So from my perspective, when I first heard of Suzanne's story, I'm like, this doesn't strike me as an area where you would have one of these crimes of opportunity, where someone is going for a bike ride or going jogging, it's so remote, and then someone would grab them, murder them, and get rid of their body. But now you're telling me there's another woman, you know, less than an hour away who was out for a walk and disappeared. Is there any 
um, I don't know, fear out there right now that there could be some sort of mountain serial killer in Colorado? You know, I haven't heard that there's any fear, but I don't live down there. It's about four hours away from Denver to the south. I don't live there, so I don't know if there's fear, but Barry Morphew's attorney is suggesting that this could be the same person, especially since this woman was uh, went missing on May 3rd, which is about the same time that Suzanne Morphew disappeared. That was May, May 9th, 10th. So she she's wondering if there's a link. I mean, she's trying to connect whatever she can to make sure the attention goes away from Barry Morphew. Wow. Okay, let's talk about some of the evidence, though, because he was, a, like we all said, he was arrested for murder. He was charged. We were waiting for the trial to begin. How about that tranquilizer dart gun that we read about? What do we know about that tranquilizer dart gun? Well, we, we know that um, this was a theory of the prosecution that perhaps he shot her with a dart gun in order to get her, you know, incapacitated so that he could then kill her later. That was the prosecution's theory. There was a, a, a piece of that dart, that little piece you see right there, part of a syringe that was found in the dryer at the Morphew home by investigators. Now, this is just a theory. The dart gun really didn't work very well. I don't know how viable it is, but it is something that if she had been hit by that dart gun, she would have gone to sleep. The prosecution and the investigation with the sheriff's office interviewed a woman up in Fort Collins at, the, at uh, Colorado State University who, uh, who studies veterinary medicine. And this dart gun um, and, and the medicine you put in the gun is used to, to tranquilize animals. And she said that if a, if a female or someone the size of Suzanne Morphew was shot with this thing, she would have gone to sleep and, and wouldn't have been able to move. How about That's the, just a theory. Right. I don't know if it's true. How about the bags of trash? So we've covered, <laughs> I've covered cases where, you know, there's a husband accused of murdering his wife, dismembering her, putting her in different bags of trash, throwing, them, throwing it out all around town. Um, what do we know about the bags of trash that he's throwing away the morning that he drives from, away from his house and goes on this business trip? Well, it, it is curious that he drove away from his home to go to Broomfield at five o'clock in the morning on Mother's Day. He had a job up there to do, and the job wasn't really supposed to be done until Monday. So in other words, the next day, the 11th. For some reason, he went to Broomfield early, early in the morning, got there about eight in the morning, and he was, uh, he was out throwing trash in different places. There was a McDonald's where he really stuffed something small and, you know, really, um, pushed it down. There's video of it. Uh, he went. He went to a men's warehouse and stuffed trash there. He stuffed trash at the hotel where he was staying, and um, he actually went out to the landscaping scene where he was putting in a retaining wall. He got back to the hotel about noon. He's seen on surveillance here. As you you are looking, you're seeing him with the trash. Um, he changed clothes, and then he went into that room for five hours. He didn't come out until about. 5.55, and uh, one would not tell investigators what he was doing for five hours in that hotel room. Uh, so that is a mystery because there were no cameras inside the room. There are just the cameras uh, that show him walking around in the hall, coming back and forth and, and removing tools and placing tools. He got the call about his wife's disappearance at about 5.15 from one of his neighbors. So he was still in the hotel room, and then about 40 minutes later, is when he decided to drive back down to his home, three hour drive, and that's when he showed up and investigators were there worried about where his wife was. Wow. Now, she had a, a boyfriend, right? And she was snapping this selfie. What was the status of their marriage and did he have a girlfriend? Did Barry have a girlfriend? Yeah. No, not that we know of. In okay. fact, she bought that spy pin to catch him in the act. And instead, it caught her in the act. Right. You know, um, she didn't tell anybody about this boyfriend, not even her best friend, who she confided everything to about her marriage. You know, she was talking about a spiraling marriage. She was talking about leaving him. She confided in this girlfriend everything, but she didn't tell him about her boyfriend, who she had a fling with for about two years. That was going on for two years. They saw each other six times 
in those two years. And there were lots of texts, hundreds of texts between the two of them. Um, but no, Barry Morphew, from all indications, did not have a relationship with another woman. And it was Mother's Day. They have two lovely daughters. Where, where were their children on that day? That's a good question. They were on a trip. They were on like a camping trip or something. And they, they had texted her on Mother's Day to say Happy Mother's Day and didn't get a response. And that's when they started getting nervous. Um, I think they're the ones, it's, it's kind of unclear to me now trying to remember, but I think they're the ones who called the neighbors and said, would you go look at the, look at the garage and see if our, our mom's there, see what you see, is her car there? And it, uh, you know, there was no sign of Suzanne Morphew. And that's when the neighbor decided I'd better call Barry and find out if Barry needs anything. So um, yeah, the sisters, the two girls, one was living at home still because she was a senior in high school, junior or senior. The other one was in college. So the younger one had told Suzanne to get a restraining order or get a divorce. She was telling her mother, this isn't working, mom. She saw the fights. The oldest sister did not see all that because she was at college. So uh, that's, been, that's been a real curiosity to see both girls sit um, always on the side of their dad, on the side of their dad in the courtroom. You know, they, they would do heart hands and they would cry and they, you know, they were, are generally sad about losing both their mom and then losing their dad when he went to jail. Yeah, family tragedy. Um, children, from what I've seen in most of the cases I've covered, an overwhelming majority, the, the children, whether they're young or adults, will always stay with the um, surviving spouse, even if they're charged with murder, That's regardless, so of, regardless of, the, of the evidence. Uh, Carol McKinley, uh, amazing. Uh, Denver Gazette, thank you so much for joining us. Tonight. We really appreciate it. So good to see you. Thanks a lot for asking. All right, Have folks. When we come back, we'll bring in the thank, uh, the thank tank, the think tank plus up next. So where exactly was Suzanne Morphew found and how far is it from her home and from where her husband says he was the day she disappeared? So there's Barry Morphew speaking on, on, to officers about his wife. He says, listen, I left, she was asleep. And then I went and I was working all day uh, in Broomfield, uh, Colorado. So let's take a look, because as he's told investigators where he was that day that she went missing. So let's kind of put this all in perspective and put a map up on the screen. And we begin with Suzanne and Barry's Colorado home. It's in the Maysville area of Salida, Colorado. Um, Suzanne's bike was found nearby the day that she went missing, May 10th, 2020. Now, her remains are found uh, in Moffitt, Colorado, more than three years after she disappeared. It's about a 51-minute drive from the Morphews' home to where her remains are found. You drive 51 minutes south. Now, Barry says he's up in Broomfield, Colorado. He says he went there on business that morning, May 10th, 2020, about a three-hour drive from Morphew's home, and it's about a three-and-a-half-hour drive uh, from uh, Moffitt where the remains were discovered. So, you know, you do the math on all of that, and you try to figure out what happened, but if he's going down to Moffitt, Colorado, as... Um, we heard in the prior segment, they, they have no evidence of him necessarily being down there. Did he have help? Is he not responsible? Is there a serial killer? What is going on? Will Barry be charged now? Will he be charged again now that they have the remains? Does that make the prosecution's case better or worse against him? Let's bring in our think tank tonight. Joining us, criminal defense attorney in Atlanta, Georgia, Eklund Mercy.
Phoenix, Arizona, the attorney who represented Jody Arias, hates her, uh, Kirk Nurmi, and deputy public defender for L.A. County. That's still Eklund. There, Philip <laughs> Dubay. All right, great to see everyone tonight. Eklund Mercy, these developments, now that Suzanne Morphew's remains have been recovered and where they were recovered, putting all these pieces together, um, does this make the prosecutor's case stronger or weaker right now? And do you expect Barry Morphew to be charged again? I just based on what I heard, I I don't. I don't I think they need more. Um, it's so separate, it's so far away. There's three years, there was another case, it was found for another case, there's a potential serial killer. Um, although he may look like the um prime suspect, um, there is no statute of limitations for murder. And I think that the prosecution if this is all they have, they need more. They're going to have a problem. So I, I think that there's a lot of answers. There's a lot of questions that need answers, and they don't have it as of right now. So, uh, Kirk Nurmi, generally speaking, right, generally speaking in cases where there's an obvious suspect and someone that investigators are looking at or prosecutors are looking at, and the body has not been found. Once the body's found, it's usually pretty quick. All right, we, oh, we recovered the body. Now we make the arrest. How about in this case? What do you expect? What, what does this, um, this discovery of this significant evidence and the location, et cetera, what does it do for the investigation, the case, as it pertains to Barry Morphew, who obviously was a suspect, he was charged with her murder? Well, I think it makes the case a lot more difficult to prove unless there's something at that crime scene that indicates that he was involved. You know, we're talking about three years of exposure. I don't think there's probably going to be any DNA. It's possible retention in clothing. I really doubt it. So the question, and we think about this, Vinny, when they made this arrest in May of 21, they charged him. Think about the probable cause statement that led to the arrest, the indictment, all the pleadings, everything else was probably based on a different theory, right? And now that theory is blown out of the water because the body's somewhere else, somewhere it, he's demonstrably not. And you do, as Eklund said, have the potential of somebody who's going around uh, uh, killing women randomly, and that could very well be a possibility. So, you know, all those things, I could see the defense really playing into that, saying confirmation bias. They just made the assertion, the assumption that he is the most likely person to do it. Granted, there's some sp suspicious behavior, but he's the most likely person to have done it. So we're going to arrest him. Now, that's just blown out of the water with facts. And facts are stubborn things, Vinny. And the state is going to have a tough time making this case with these facts that come out now. Hi, right, Philip Dubé. You, you, we've got the new developments where she is found where it is in relation to their home and to where he was and he was on video that day her last communication to anyone is a bikini selfie to her lover uh, the day before her bicycle is found nearby then the helmet is found less than a mile away put those pieces together for me what does it mean well, first of all, I think you've left out some key pieces. Uh, now, first of all, she's not June Cleaver. You know, she's not the Carol Brady, Mother Teresa, Mother of the Year kind of gal. Remember, her two kids are away at sleepaway camp. They're expecting the kids back later in the day for Mother's Day. So dad takes the morning off to go to a job site. So it explains why they're not together during the day on Mother's Day. So what does she do? She goes off on her own frolic. Well, what we need to know from the coroner Wait, is what do you mean she goes off homicide. on her own frolic? What, what does that mean, Philip? She goes off on her frolic. Because, in other words, she got on her bike, took okay. a ride somewhere, and uh, in other words, not necessarily in disregard of Mother's Day, but she went off, did her own thing, because the kids weren't home, the husband wasn't home, and they were going to celebrate Mother's Day later in the day after her teenage daughters come home. But what's key here is the reason why the case was dismissed is because the prosecution withheld Brady evidence, exculpatory evidence. They found DNA on the glove box that matched uh, an unknown male donor 
whose DNA was uh, also came up in three unsolved rapes. So no matter what happens here, if you don't have anything forensically tying the husband to her remains, what you do have is DNA basically from a serial rapist in her SUV on the glove box. I don't think the case changes. If anything, by finding the body, it could actually make it worse for the prosecution. Against, against Barry Morphew, okay. So what do you think happened here, Eklund? What, what, what do you think could have happened here? Uh, do you think the bicycle is more likely she went for a ride or more likely that it was staged by whoever the killer was? You know, you've got, uh, as, as Philip rightfully pointed out, you've got this male donor DNA in her glove box, but she's out on her bike. Like, how, how do those two things um, make sense together either? Well, uh... Her being on her bike on Mother's Day is not out of the ordinary. Um, if you talk to most mothers on Mother's Day, they want to be far away from <laughs> their spouses and their children. That is, that what? is the gift. That's the gift. That's, that's space. The, some space, space is, is the gift. gift. Gotcha. So, oh, yeah. with that, with that yeah. being said, so with her driving, I mean. With her taking her bike, that's not out of the ordinary. She wants to um, have space. But the problem is we have a lover. We have uh, um, DNA from rapists. We have other murderers, um, other missing peoples. And we have bodies. This, this, this is convoluted as hell. And it just seems pretty lazy, you know, on um, investigators. And to just leave it at that, just... Um, putting all of that work on the jury instead of the prosecution. The prosecution should have a theory. I don't see a theory. I see, oh, trash cans, and he goes to trash cans. That doesn't hold up the case. Um, with all their resources, with all their burden, they need more. We will continue to follow it. We'll be talking about this uh, in the days to come. Um, to me... I agree, I think, with all of you. This, is, this makes it much more complicated uh, for prosecutors to put the pieces together. And I'm interested about this other missing woman in Colorado that they were investigating in that area.